Well, if he's yours, say amen. amen. Take your Bible and find the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Well, if all those here and all those listening really meant what the choir just sang, I love to worship, uh, then tonight this place will be packed. One amen here, one there, and one over there. If they really believe that, I promise you the crowd we had earlier in this crowd, we'd pack this place out. Amen? And by the way, he's worthy. He is worthy of our worship and our praise. The moment I said about being back tonight, that just uh, some of you. But, uh, man, we have a great time around here on Sunday nights. Amen? Amen. You ought to join us. All right. All right. Don't forget all the events coming up. We got our our youth here. They uh, they're probably going to fall asleep while I'm preaching. Uh, but they're supposed to went to bed early. Where are the youth leaders at? Yeah, they're supposed to went to bed early. They were texting at one or two o'clock in the morning. Hello. But I'm glad they're here. If you're proud of our youth, let's let them know. Amen. They'll be sharing a little bit in the service tonight, and I'll say a word about them in my message today. But we're preaching on the, the life of Christ leading up to Resurrection Sunday, just a few weeks away. So uh, you'll be praying two weeks from today. Dr. Jerry Vines will be with us for the morning services. So you pray for Dr. Vines. He'll be here at the pastor and wives banquet and then be staying over to preach in the morning services on uh, the 24th. But uh, we're heading toward the Resurrection Sunday. Of course, every Sunday ought to be Resurrection Sunday. Matthew 27, if you found the place and you're physically able, would you stand with us in honor and in reverence to the reading of God's holy, inspired, infallible, inerrant word? Verse number 12 is where we're starting, Matthew 27. And when Jesus was accused of the chief priest and the elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would, whoever they would choose. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For Pilate knew that for envy they delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ. They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. The governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Then answered all the people and said, let his blood be on us and our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Lord, I'm glad today that you can be ours. And Lord, you said, I know my sheep, and they hear my voice, and I know them, and they know me. Lord, I'm preaching to hundreds this morning in the building and by way of live streaming and by the radio, and Lord, no doubt right here in this building, there are people who've never been saved. Holy Spirit of God, 
Would you please walk down the aisles of this church? Walk down the pews of this church. Knock on the hearts of boys and girls and men and women. And may today they leave not like Pilate, but Lord, may they leave washed in the blood of the Lamb. Holy Spirit, press upon our hearts today the decision that we will make about Jesus, either to accept Him or to reject Him. And I pray today it will be in the affirmative. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. I'm preaching today on this subject, what will you do with Jesus? The choice is yours. So the real question in the Bible, and the question of all humanity is, what will you do with Jesus? There's an old invitational hymn that the chorus of it goes like this. What will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. And one day your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? It's the question of all questions. It's the question of destiny. And how you answer that question, what you do with the Lord Jesus, will determine whether you spend eternity in heaven or in hell. It's been noted as a present question, and it is today, because I'm asking you right now, not, not some future date, but right now. It's a personal question that everybody must answer. I'm asking you, whatever your name is. It is a pressing question. He said, I'm asking you, and it's a passing question. One day he'll never ask again. So you can either accept him or reject him, crown him or crucify him, confess him or deny him. It's the question of the minute, of the hour, of the day, of the week, of the month. It's the question of the year. It's the question of your life. What are you going to do with Jesus? Now, Pilate's got this on his hands. He can't get rid of the Lord Jesus, and neither can you. One day you're going to give an account as to what you did with Jesus. He's the inescapable, unavoidable, inevitable Christ. And he's on the hands of Pilate. Pilate is confronted with the Lord Jesus. You and I are confronted with the Lord Jesus. And the question is, what am I going to do with Jesus? Now, Pilate represents all of humanity. And just as Jesus was before Pilate, Pilate was before God. And just as Jesus was in Pilate's hands, so is Jesus in your hands. What are you going to do with him? Just as Pilate was in God's hands, you and I are in God's hands. So I'm going to ask you that age-old question. Or affirm what has already been said what have I done or what shall I do with Christ? Now, this is for the saved and the lost. For the lost, you need to be saved. For, for the saved, you need to crown him Lord of every part of your life. Amen. Amen. Amen? So follow me. Here's Jesus before Pilate. He's confronted with the Voices that are speaking, and so are you. In verse 17 and 18 of our text, it says, When they were gathered together, Pilate said, Whom shall you that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called the Christ? For Pilate knew it wasn't for wrong that he had done, but for envy they had delivered the Lord Jesus. Some very strong voices were speaking to Pilate that day, and they're speaking to you and to me. We're confronted in all kinds of ways. There's the voice of reason that spoke to him. Pilate's no fool. You don't get to be where he was by, by being a, a fool, or at least in some ways. He was a fool for not receiving Christ. But evidently, Pilate had uh, progressed, and now 
he's in this leadership position and he knows they've drummed up the charges against Jesus. So common sense, honest consideration spoke to Pilate that day. And I pray that logic will speak to you. Now, you don't get saved merely by logic. But logic can prepare your mind to bring you to Christ. Friend, if you look around this world, hey, this world didn't just pop out of a can. And I don't care what these folks with all kinds of degrees behind their names say, it didn't happen by evolution. It happened by creation. So common logic speaks today. You and I are faced with Christ. He's an historical fact. There's more evidence to prove that Jesus Christ walked on the earth than there is that George Washington walked upon the earth. The evidence is there. You're dealing with a trilemma. He's either Lord, liar, or lunatic. He's either deity, deceived, or deceiver. Who do you think the one that gave that sermon on the mount is. Who do you think the one that touched those folks and healed them is? Well, if I were to ask you today in our, one of our songs, it says, has anybody here been healed? Raise your hand up high. And everybody here would have to raise your hand up high because God's touched you in some way. In your life, he's touched you. Who, who do you think the one that that spoke to that little girl, I say unto thee, Tabitha, arise. Who do you think the one that went by the grave of Lazarus and said, hey, Lazarus, get up. We're going to lunch. Hello? Who, who do you think that he was? Why, he's none other than the Lord God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ. So logic is speaking today. And then the, there's the, the voice of relatives speaking to him. Verse 19, his wife said, had a dream. And in that dream, God told me to tell you, don't have anything to do with this just man. So God spoke to her and she spoke to Pilate. So he's not without warning. Whatever he does, he's been warned. When you leave this building today, you will not be able to go into eternity and say, I would have got saved had I known better. Because before you leave, you're going to get the gospel up and down, and you won't have that excuse when you stand before God. Amen. You, like Pilate, got to receive him or reject him. Logic and love speaks to you. Why, well, this church loves you. Amen. Amen? Amen? Your family loves you. Your friends love you. Why, you've been invited to Christ by, by a Bible fellowship teacher or a vacation Bible school or a youth worker or a pastor or a singer or a mama or a daddy or a grandma or a grandpa. Give us some rocking chair grandmas back that'll rock them babies and sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a rich like me and tell those boys and girls the good news of Jesus Christ. So God's speaking today. A boy was getting ready to go out on the town. He got his coat, gathered up his things. He's going out to party and get drunk. His mom had been praying for him for a long time. With tears in her eyes watching her boy get ready to leave, she put a track beside his things so that when he walked out and picked them up, you'd see that track. He picked up his keys and his glove, and he saw that gospel track that mama laid down there, and it infuriated him. He said, Mama, when I got off the bus today, somebody handed me one of these blankety-blank gospel tracks, and now I'm getting ready to go out on the town and have a good time, and you hand me a track? I'm sick of it. Where can I go that nobody will bother me and give me one of these tracks? And mama said, Son, you can die and go to hell, and nobody will witness to you in hell. Some uh, mamas and daddies and spouses and, and uh, brothers and sisters and family members and friends have, have begged you to get saved. They, they prayed for you to get saved. 
Paul said, my prayer to God uh, for Israel is that they might be saved. So I urge you today, don't reject the voice of logic and the voice of love, but then there's also the voice of light. Uh, Pilate was spoke to by his own conscience. In the Bible, in Luke chapter 23, verse 4 and 22, it says twice that Pilate said, I find no fault in him. I've examined him from every way, and I find no fault in him. Dr. Adrian Rogers was witnessing to a Jewish man who was still looking for the Messiah. Dr. Rogers told him about Jesus and all that Jesus was. And he asked that Jewish man, said, are you still waiting for the Messiah to come? And that Jewish man said, yes, we're still waiting on the Messiah. Dr. Rogers looked at him and said, sir, if what you're saying is true and if the Messiah comes, how in the world is he going to improve on the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus was perfect in every way. And Pilate's confronted with Christ. And I want to say with Pilate today, I find no fault in Jesus. Then there's the voice of the Lord that spoke to him. The Lord spoke to Pilate. Jesus spoke not a word to begin with. And Pilate said, uh, so you're a king? He said, you say I am a king. God spoke to Pilate. You say he's never spoken to me. Oh, he has. Now, I've seen some folks, they told me God spoke to them, and I think they ate too much before they went to bed. That was their problem because some of the things they told me that God said, I, I, I can't. Uh... But anyway, God does speak. He spoke to you through the songs this morning if you're listening. He spoke through your Bible fellowship teacher if you were there. He's speaking through his word today, and he's saying to everybody here that I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, and it is as if Jesus is right here on this platform speaking to you right now and asking you, what are you going to do with what I did for you at Calvary? See, I'm just a Western Union boy. I just deliver the paper. I just delivered the message. I didn't write it. I didn't make it up. I just delivered it. So there's voices that are speaking to Pilate, and they're speaking to us. There's values that conformed him as well. Why didn't Pilate get saved? Can I ask you, why won't you get saved? You're watching by live streaming? Sir, why don't you give your heart and life to the Lord Jesus? Why wouldn't Pilate take a stand with Christ? There's several reasons. Number one, public opinion. Mark 15, 15 said he wanted to content the people and he gave Jesus to the crowd. He's in Pilate's hands. Although God's got this thing all worked out. God's not surprised by Pilate. He's not surprised by the crowd. He's not surprised by what they want to do but for that moment, he's in Pilate's hands. And Pilate could say guilty or innocent. But he wanted to please the crowd, and Pilate's got pressure on him. Sounds like 2024, doesn't it? We got politicians, we got preachers that want to please the crowd and want to tickle their ears and not tell them the whole truth of the Word of God. Amen. Hello. Amen. Amen. Sticking their finger up in the air and seeing which wind, way the wind's blowing, the politicians are, and, and they feel in the pressure, man. They just need enough, we call it, in city view, guts. Amen. Intestinal fortitude for you city folks <laughs> to decide what's right. And preachers, the same thing. Not worried about what the deacons are going to say or, or the pulpit committee is going to say or anybody else is going to say, but what does God say? And God says you've got to make a decision about what you're going to do with me.
Now, some of you here today and listening by radio and by live stream, you won't get saved because you want to be with the in crowd. Now, everybody likes to be like, amen? amen. I don't know of anybody who gets up every morning and prays, God, surround me with people that hate me today. If you do, you're a nut. Everybody likes for people to like them. But some of you have some things you're not willing to give up even for Jesus. Even for eternity. Even for heaven. Friends. Habits. Why religion? You're so conscious of what people think. You say, I'm not going down there. I'm not giving my life to Christ. Well, I'm a middle schooler, I'm a high schooler, I'm a college student, I, I'm, I'm a young person. All the more reason you ought to get saved. Remember thy Creator now in the days of thy youth, while the evil days draw not nigh. Pilate lost his soul listening to public opinion, and somebody said it a long time ago, if you displease God, it doesn't matter who you please. If you please God, it don't matter who you displease. Now, I don't think that means you ought to go around just uh, looking for somebody to chew out either. Amen? I don't think that means that at all. But why go to hell for the crowd? Why let the crowd dictate what you're going to do? young lady came to the revival meeting, and she was there. The first night, the Spirit of God seemed to be moving. People were praying. Man, that's what you ought to do. We want to see the power come down. Well, I'm a preaching. You ought to be a praying. Amen? You ought to be a praying. God, fill this place with the Holy Spirit of God. Fill it full, Lord. It was on that night, and a, a worker went back to a young lady sitting in the back. Don't ever do that unless God tells you to do it. She knelt down beside her and said, Sweetheart, won't you come down to the front and confess Christ as your personal Savior? And she said, oh, no. I could never go down there in front of all of those people. And the service ended, and she didn't go forward. She came back the next night. Same thing happened. Spirit of God was moving. She was sitting back there under conviction. Same person went back to her and said, ma'am, why not tonight? Why don't you come forward and be saved? She said, can it be saved back here? And she said, no, you can't be saved back here. You've got to be willing to come forward. She came back the third night. Conviction was evident, and the same lady went to her again. Said, won't you come down front and be saved tonight? And the young girl said, oh, yes. I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere if I can have peace in my heart with God. And the lady said, now you don't have to go down to the front. You can get saved right here. You've got to be willing. The Bible says, whosoever believes in him shall not be ashamed. Sunday night at Wahoo, many years ago, piano player was playing the invitational hymn. In the middle of the invitational hymn, she just quit playing. I don't know if something was was wrong with her so I looked over there and she got up from the piano and she walked about halfway back of the church and there was a big old burly guy and she reached up on her tiptoes and put her arms around his neck got mascara all over his shirt and begged him said Ralph Ralph won't you get saved tonight Ralph come go with me down to the altar Ralph give your heart to Jesus Ralph and Ralph said no and he wouldn't go. She came back to the piano and started playing about another verse. Old big old burly guy bust out of that pew weeping and a squalling and came and gave his heart and life to the Lord Jesus. Don't you do that unless God tells you to do it. But you may be standing beside somebody and you can sense the Spirit of God moving and you might just say, I'll go with you if you want to go. You don't pressure them. Don't put them in a uh, neck hole. If the Spirit of God tells you, if He don't, don't you do it. Amen. Pride kept Pilate from getting saved. He's escorted to hell by the chains of pride. Some of you won't get saved because of, of your pride. Some of you won't get baptized because of your pride. You say, it'll mess up my hairdo. 
Well, some of us don't have that problem, amen? Some of you got other reasons why if I get baptized, what are they going to think about me? Pilate's a big shot. Pilate died a big shot. Pilate went to hell a big shot, but in hell he's not a big shot anymore. His position or possession kept him from coming to Christ. They got old Pilate right where they wanted him, but he's got that position. He's motivated by materialism. He's got a good job that he don't want to lose. A lot of people won't get saved because of their position or their possession. Why, look at what I am at school. Why, I'm the captain of whatever you're captain of. I, I'm this, I'm that. Why, if I get saved, what are they going to think? Well, the bottom line is it really don't matter what they think. What matters is getting saved. Yes, sir. Right. sir, at the company, ma'am, at the company, what matters is you getting saved and then taking it home and telling your family about it. A lot of people won't get saved because of position or possession. Some will even say, man, if I go and get saved on that church, all they want is my money. Well, that's a, not true. Very seldom we talk about that. I'm thankful for the folks and the way they give here. Now, if everybody gave, I don't know what we'd do with all the money. Hello. Hey, you can't outgive God. Now, I don't have time to tell you all that, but I tell you, you can't do it. God's good. Amen. God, God, God will bless. Hey, we don't, we're not, not interested in your money. We're interested in your soul. We want you to get saved. We don't want you to go to hell. We want you to go to heaven. That's why our youth were out yesterday knocking on doors, standing in front of the hospital out there washing cars and witnessing for Christ and many other things. Now, everybody don't like that. Never have. Devil never has liked it when people go out and try to get the gospel outside the walls of the church. Hey, that's what he's trying to do. Hey, Christianity's okay, but y'all keep it on the inside. Don't let it get on the outside. Be careful, America. They're talking about things in high places today today not 20 years from now today that if they get their way they're going to look at the way you spend your money and they're going to find out whether you're buying bibles or religious material that ain't none of their business amen the devil don't want the gospel outside these four walls and they had somebody yesterday didn't like it because they weren't going out asking for anything. They were going out praying for people. Amen. Man, I don't know anybody, anybody that wouldn't want somebody to pray for. Amen? Amen. Amen. Anybody. But there was one that didn't like that. He didn't like that. The devil don't want us to get outside the four walls of this church, but if we're ever going to reach the world, we've got to get outside this church. We've got to be a witness all through the week. There, there's a the last thing here. There's a verdict that condemned him. Many say, I'm not going to answer the question, what am I going to do with Jesus? And I don't mean it in a smart aleck way, but yes, you will. You're bowing up right now saying, no, I won't. You can't make me. Yes, you will. Because if you decide not to decide for him, you just decided against him. He said, you're either for me are against me. There's no fence straddlers. You're either for me or against me. Now, Pilate did this. He, he tried to soften the verdict in chapter 18 of John, verse 31. He tried to ignore it. He tried to put the question off, the question at hand. He just put it off. He said, I want to remain neutral. And Pilate said to the crowd, you take him and, and you judge him because I find no fault in it. You judge him. Well, that's okay, Pilate. But you still got to make a decision about him. Then he tried to put the burden on somebody else. He, he thought he had an out, so he sent Jesus to Herod, and Herod sent him right back. Friend, I want to tell you, you can't get away from the inescapable, unavoidable Christ. Why did the Bible put this episode here? Because nobody can decide for you. Mama can't get saved for you. 
Daddy can't get saved for you. Grandpa can't get saved for you. Grandma can't get saved for you. Deacon so-and-so can't get saved for you. You've got to make that decision for yourself. You've got to personally come. Then Pilate tried to admire Jesus. In Luke 23, he says all these good things about the Lord Jesus. said, I don't find any fault in him. He may have said, I think a lot about Jesus. And that's good. But thinking about him and receiving him is two different things. This world says he's a good guy. Some denominations say he's a good prophet. Hey, can I tell you? He's more than a good man. He's more than a good prophet. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the Savior of my soul. And He is the soon coming King of kings and Lord of lords. And then Pilate tried to remain neutral. His indecision was the worst decision of all. Listen now. Pilate went to hell. Not because he smoked and not because he drank and not because he chewed tobacco, and not because he was immoral. Listen to me. You know why Pilate went to hell? Because he refused Jesus Christ. Now, some of y'all, if y'all took that the wrong way, all that other stuff you need to put aside when you give your heart to Christ. But that didn't send him to hell. Only rejecting Jesus Christ. You not always have a chance to confess him. One day it'll be too late. You remember I've told it several times, young folks. The illustration of don't take a chance. A little girl in the church writing in the hymn books, leaves the church, has a terrible automobile wreck in ICU, and she's about to die, and the preacher goes in there and sees her mumbling but can't hear what she's saying, puts his ear down to her mouth, and she's mumbling over and over again, don't take a chance. And he quickly tries to tell her about Jesus, and she dies before he ever hears her decision. One day it'll be absolutely too late. Well, if we could bring Jesus and Barabbas back here today, one on either side, and I'd say to you what Pilate said, whom will you choose today, Barabbas? Or Jesus. Now you may not say Barabbas, but if you hadn't chosen Jesus, in reality, you're taking Barabbas. Let me give you a couple of testimonies and we're through. John the Baptist. Hey, John, you his cousin. What kind of man was Jesus, John? And John said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Peter, why, why, Peter, you walked with him. I know you denied him and, and you cussed that he ever knew him, but Peter, tell me about him. He said, Oh, he's the Christ, Son of the living God. John, who wrote John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. John, what did you think about him? He said, Our eyes saw him, our hands saw him. Held him. Thomas, you, you were the one who doubted. Thomas, what's your testimony? He said, my testimony is this, my Lord and my God. Why, God the Father looked down. Hey, God the Father, what do you got to say about Jesus Christ? He said, he's my beloved son. Hear him. Pilate, on his way to hell, said, I find no fault in Jesus. The centurion that watched him die said, truly this man is the Son of God. And the thief on the cross said, this man has done nothing amiss. One last testimony is from Judas, from hell. Judas, what's your testimony? I am guilty because I have betrayed innocent blood. So what do you think of Christ? 
What will you do with with Jesus Christ? And, And what you do with Jesus Christ will determine what Jesus Christ does with you. We could go around the building today and not just give you Bible testimonies, but testimonies of men and women of how Jesus has changed their life. And this Jesus has totally transformed and saved their soul. And they're ready when he calls to go to heaven. But are you? And are you? And are you? Did you bow your heads and close your eyes? No one's looking around. 